Good morning, everyone. Hopefully I'm in the right spot. I see all your texting, so um, I think I have found it. It's Wednesday, the 31st of May, 2023. Um, happy you're here. Welcome to Change the Shed. And uh, yeah, we're back again. I think it's been about three weeks since we did this, so let's do it again. I'll be back next on June 14, which is a Wednesday. There was a reason I had switched it to Tuesday, but you can ignore that. It's back to Wednesday on June 14 is in two weeks. And so hopefully I'll see you all back then. And uh, there's a calendar on my website now under online learning. So if you need to just check when Change the Shed is or find where it is, you can go there. And uh, all the other class things, if you're in classes with lots of live events and stuff, um, you can look on that calendar page. Yay! So it looks like people are popping in from all over. Saw some people from the UK and Canada. Julia's here from Germany. Barbara from San Diego. Um, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania. Laura, La Laura Lean. Anyway, from Quebec, Canada, and Judy from BC. We have a lot of Canadians here today. Uh, Mary Lou from Cape Cod, uh, Kansas City. Hi, Betsy. Leslie from Vermont. Um, I'm super jealous that Nan is going on the tapestry tour that I took uh, in 2019 before COVID, the last one that Christy Colette did before COVID. So. Chrissy is doing the tour again this year. So the lucky people who get to go, hopefully we'll post some stuff about it. Monica's here from Ontario. Hilly's here from the Netherlands. Renee, Massachusetts. Marlena from Texas. Um, Victoria from California. Washington. Britt's here from Holland. Uh, fun, fun, you guys. It's fun to see where you're all from. Mary from Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Oregon. Sybil's here from Switzerland. Um, Nancy's here from Conifer, right down the road from me. Um, Conifer's lovely. Um, Delaware. And Mari's here from Hawaii. Hawaii. Never been to Hawaii. One day I will go. Um, and Janice is here from Oregon. So welcome, welcome to summer. It's gonna be June tomorrow. So I think uh, we're ready to go. It's getting warmer and uh, I am working on summer of tapestry. So um, if you want a fun summer class, it is open. The preparation week is this week. It just means that you figure out what we're doing and get your supplies together. And then on Friday, the first prompt opens and it's about an eight week thing all about just having fun, um, simplifying designs and weaving simple tapestries, whether you're staying at home or going somewhere else. So um, I've been talking about it a lot. I still have some spaces in the class. If anybody would love to join, it's been really fun. If you go to the class page on my website under online learning for summer tapestry, you'll see some of what people said last year and um, it's been Super fun and I can't wait to do it again. All new content, it's not the same class as last year, it's a completely new class, so something you can do every year. And I will be weaving on one of the pieces for this uh, um, class today, so that'll be fun. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody, we still got more people popping in South Carolina and um, Betsy and Nancy and Carolyn from the north of England, Judith from Florida, Canary Islands, uh, Patricia, welcome. Oh, Betsy's taking the ECOT class from Mary Zickafoos. I've taught at Midwest Weavers and it's, um, it's hot there in the summer, no matter where they have it, but y'all in the Midwest are used to that. <laughs> so Mary Zickafoos class will be fantastic, Betsy. I hope you have fun. Uh, Betsy, uh, Mary is a delightful person and um, super amazing with her ECOT. Um, the loom over my right shoulder, which may be flipped. My right shoulder is this one, so maybe it is that loom with the shacked Aras. 
The looms on the other side of the room are Mirex. So yeah, Shaft de Ross, great loom. Um, really like the... It has been sitting there. Oh, there's actually a, a two looms here. Sorry. That, that's the Shaft de Ross, and this is a um, frame loom from Weaver's Bazaar, which is another great loom. You all saw me weaving on this, which I clearly have not finished yet. Uh, so, yeah, that is the Shacked, and it's a great loom. I put that warp on, I don't know how long ago yet, intending to weave a new piece for my fire series on Change the Shed, and as you can see, it is still empty. But hopefully this summer, um, I've been... When I was up at CSU Mountain Campus last week, which is why I couldn't have changed the shed last week, I was teaching um, a lot more look at the um, burn up there that we had in 2020. Uh, so really interesting to see how, you know, two to three years later, it's not quite three years yet, how things are regenerating and how sometimes they are not. So anyway, yeah, all fun. So yeah, Summer of Tapestry, if you'd like to join that class, I highly recommend it. It is so much fun. It's the, it's my favorite thing. Um, it's a lot about simplification, although you're going to ask about that when you see what I'm weaving today, um, which is, um, does not look simple. It actually is quite simple, but um, it doesn't look simple. Maybe that's the key. Uh, and then those of you who have donated to Change the Shed, thank you so much. This is still a free program because of you. I really appreciate it. I've considered repeatedly putting this program on Patreon, which means it's behind a paywall. And that means that a lot of people don't have access. So I appreciate those of you who do are able to give um, a little bit towards this program remaining free. I really appreciate it. It really makes a big difference. It pays for the tech and some other things that I need to run this thing, um, like the new uh, stand I had to get, which I couldn't get out of the camera view today. For whatever reason, my spatial skills were not working enough to get it moved. So there it is. Um, yes, thank you. If you'd like to leave a donation, it's under on my website on the Change the Shed page. Where you should go if you want to see past Change the Sheds, there's links to all kinds of stuff and pictures of what I worked on that day. So say you want to go back and figure out how to do a double set piece or something. You can look through there and go find the hand basket piece or whatever you're looking for. Um, <laughs> Mari, I appreciate that. She says, if, if the warp is on and ready to go, you've made a good start. It's very encouraging. Thank you. It is true. <laughs> I try to remember that. I have a warp on my big loom. Ready to go. I've made a start. So... At least it's, uh, we're one step closer. All right, I have um, a piece today. Here, I'll show you this before I change the camera. So I have, um, there's a point in life where you become a birder, right? I mean, some of us, if we like being outdoors and I feel like you hit middle age and then you're like, birding, that's my thing. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of funny jokes about that. Anyway, the birds are amazing and this spring has been great. This is just four pictures of birds from my feeder. Most, this, most of this photo is just taken with my phone, so they're not great. But the piece I'm working on is about the birds at my feeder. So, and if you're in the Summer of Tapestry class, you'll get more information about how I designed it and what I did. So, um, yeah, birds at the feeder in the backyard. So that's what I'm working on today. Here's the piece. Um, birds at my feeder in the backyard and um, it definitely looks uh, maybe more than a little confusing. So I did a second piece already. I've already redone this, but I have to finish the first piece first. Um, and I'm having so much fun. This is one of the most fun things I've woven in a long time. So I'm going to finish it because it has been great. Um, so what I did is I made a list of the birds at the feeder that I really liked and then I looked at their colors and so I'm just weaving the colors of the birds and this is my little um, cartoon I did. Here's the grackle. If you know grackles, they are black but they're also iridescent. So I used some silk in there. And this is the western tanager which is really fun for me to see because we don't see them a lot and um, they're really bright. And then this one I'm working on now is a goldfinch um, 
either female goldfinch or a winter goldfinch before they turn really bright yellow. And then I'm going to put a spring goldfinch up here, the male one that becomes super bright because we do see a lot of those. So, and I'm outlining each of these and I chose this green for an outline. Uh, I'm going to make it darker as I go up, but um, I think, yeah, if I redo this a third time, I have some ideas for how to play with it. But the idea is just that it's a simple um, tapestry, fun to weave, and I've had so much fun doing it that it has been well worth it. So I'm doing this little bit that's the goldfinch, winter goldfinch, and I'm using, they're actually kind of greenish. This is a ray. This one is the Lime 5. It's the lightest lime color. If you've seen the whole range, the darkest one is super bright, but the lightest one actually is about the color of the this particular bird. This is Olive 5, the lightest olive color. And then I'm going to use a tiny bit of this marigold because they have a little, I'll probably mix it with something because they have a little bit of that gold in their chest, even in the winter. And then they are also have white and black on their feathers. So let us, oh, and then on this side, I'm just doing stripes of what the colors are. So like this was a woodpecker, this part here with a red head and just the black and white mixed. This one was a spotted towhee which is another fun bird, which has this sort of rusty breast and then black and white spots. And so I'm just um, sort of making a stripes on the side and filling in the colors of the birds. Yes, lazuli bunting. I did another piece all about that. So if you're in Summer of Tapestry, you'll see that piece. Let's do... I wanted to make this a little bit rounded, sort of like their breasts are rounded, but let's just add in a little of this yellow and see what it looks like. So I'm gonna mix this marigold, it's marigold four, with this little bit darker olive five. Just see what happens. Weft bundling is really fun. Mixing colors. Ooh, my pipe loom is feeling a little, I wore one this last night, but for whatever reason this morning it feels looser. That often happens with the cotton same twine, is it, or it's just me, but um, if the weather changes, if it's more humid, it's been really humid here. It can um, feel like it is loosening up, the, the warp is loosening up. Gonna do this eccentrically. Yeah, I agree. Judy says they sometimes get the tanager in Western tanager in BC. And uh, I only see them in May. And they, I know in other places of the country, I've heard people say they're kind of pests, but I think they're beautiful. We don't see them very long, so they're really pretty. Um, and I'm going to just go back and fill this in. I think I'm going to like that little bit of yellow in there. It mixes well with the green. But let's see what it does on this side. There's just something that's so much fun about just playing with, thinking about the birds and like playing with the colors and finding ones that work and um, I'm not trying to weave sh weave shapes of the birds at all. I'm just interested in their colors or um, maybe some of their personality sometimes. Um, I think I'll do, huh, let's go for one more eccentric piece. <laughs> we'll dare to go one more and then I might... No, I do want to get a little black and white in there. So nope. Let's weave this. Um, I call it weaving straight. <laughs> Maybe it's not the way 
And that's not what I mean. What I mean is weaving perpendicular to the warp, not eccentrically. This is just a ray, this yarn. And this is at, pretty sure it's 10, 10 ends per inch. I'm using two strands. Let's see, I'm gonna leave a little room there. Because it's a pipe loom, I can Make the set whatever I want. Another great advantage of making your own pipe loom. You're not, the set can be anything. You just have to be careful when you set it up and then good to go. looks a lot. I should have popped a photo of this bird up, but I, um, it would take me a minute to find it. Um, I might keep the white. I'm an, I want a little white and black, but I think I'm going to keep them separate instead of like down here in the um, woodpecker. They're much more, their white and black is much more um, mixed in that bird than actually if I had a photo pulled up, I would have a better thought of it, but I think the white and black feathers of this bird are separate. They're just um, alternate, actually. Did I have? Let's just see. Yeah, there we go. So in this corner, it's this bird. So you can see it's sort of greenish. And then the white and black feathers are separate. They're not all mixed together. They're um, sort of striped a little bit. Uh, Judy asked why I designed the stripe on the left with horizontal sections when the rest is curvy. I don't know. I just wanted to try it. I wanted um, something different. I didn't want the whole thing to be, I knew it was gonna be confusing. There's a lot going on. And if I ever do this again, I will make the sections between the fewer birds and the sections between have some kind of a buffer in there, maybe with white or black. Um, but yeah, I don't have any real. Uh, maybe it's sort of like an accounting thing, like, oh, I want a strip of all the different colors and all the birds on the side. I don't know. No real reason. I mean, I don't need to have a reason, but yeah. Okay, I'm going to actually make this white sort of curve up a little bit. Then we'll put black in. It's like um, you weave slits where the stripe colors are not the same. Um, oh, I think I know what you're asking. So uh, this is completely separate here. Uh, I'm not weaving all the way across, but I am just connecting it. Instead of stitching the slit, I just every now and then I'm going over to hook them together. You can see it right here in the red. The rest of them are kind of subtle. Whether you want to call that laziness or a design element, it's up to you. But let's back that out. Uh, 
Oh, I don't like that. I don't like it when I end up with two. So I screwed that up myself. I don't want them stacked like that, the slits, um, the relays. All right, let's just do that. I'm not even gonna try to splice those. All right, so there's a little white, and actually, I guess in the, if you look at the picture of the birds, the white is pretty, the white in the wings is pretty white. So we'll go with it. The intention is not to try to match the colors exactly, it's just to have fun um, spending time looking at the birds and thinking about what might work and what weft bundles might make the color you want and just spending more time with something that was fun to observe in the first place. And that's what Summer of Tapestry is all about. Thanks, Marla. Glad you like the piece. Um, it'll be, I don't know yet when it's done, we'll see. Um, I've had so much fun weaving it that I have some suspicion that I might weave another one with a couple different ideas. So this is the array black. I actually, you can even see it here. In the grackle, I wanted black, black, because they can look really, really black. The black of the goldfinch is even um, fairly black, but it's a little grayer. So anyway, I used Weaver's Bazaar for the grackle because their black is much deeper than, this is the darkest array black and this is the darkest Weaver's Bazaar black. Ooh, black is quite a subject. There are so many blacks. Purple black, green black. These colors are made with just black, so they are, you know, just grayscale, but. All right. Almost to the top of this little guy. Then we're gonna do flicker, which I both love and they're annoying. <laughs> they're loud. And until I got a flicker house, they would drill at 6 a.m. into the side of my house, but my house has metal flashing and vinyl siding. So it just sounds like a jackhammer and they can't actually make a hole in the house, which I guess is good. Put up a flicker house. Starlings moved in, no more flickers. Um, we still get flickers, but they don't uh, try to drill into the side of my house to make a nest. The starlings are, you know, chase them off. Starlings are kind of fierce. I think they're kind of fierce. Um, Oh good, Marlena says she's weaving something from the, so in Summer of Tapestry in the Preparation Week, there's a little free, um, well, it's not little, it's a mini course. Some of you may have signed up for the free mini course, which if you, um, whether or not you're doing Summer of Tapestry, you should take that, you should get a look at that free um, mini course in my, it was the last blog post that went up, has the free course in it, and um, there's a thing about using color, which is actually from Summer of Tapestry from last year. And anyway, Marlena was saying that she did, um, she's doing a little color piece based on that. So cool. And she's doing the colors of the wildflowers in her backyard. That's awesome. Perfect thing to do for a color piece. Um, awesome. I love to see it, Marlena. She's, she'll put it in the class. Um, Yeah, so this shed stick, actually I have two of them here. Paul is asking about the shed sticks. These are from Stephen Willette. So these are my, I don't wanna say they're my new favorites, but they are my new favorites. I really like how pointy he gets these and they're beautiful. This little guy has um, teeth on the end, which I find actually quite useful, just for a little quick thing. So Stephen Willette, he says, he um, has a website and is makes great stuff. Um, 
Oh, Mary Lou says the flickers drill on their metal bird feeder. Gosh, they're, well, they are woodpeckers, so I guess we shouldn't be that surprised, but um, they sure are noisy. Okay, I want to finish this curve outline. And so we're gonna do that. And I am using, um, I'm gonna keep using this green. This is Meadow 2. And I just need enough to do a sequence. This is eccentric. I've made, I've carefully done this so that this would weave all the way across, but if it doesn't, of course you can fix your shed so you can do this. And I want that to join up with this one, so I'm actually gonna put it there. And then, Hmm. I'm going to do that over a little bit. Lots of weft in there. I'm going to bring it all the way back so I can splice it where it's flat. Actually, I would usually be picking this shed. If I were not doing this on camera, the um, loom would probably be at a little different angle. I tend to lean it against my lap on a table and I pick it. So my, meaning that my, I'm using my left hand to pick up the next sheds, but I actually find that hard to do it when it's on this table like this, which I do so that y'all can see with the camera. have not man it's so funny that black almost looks brown to me and I think it's in contrast to this black um, so here I was doing those greens from the goldfinch and I think I will add maybe I will add another sequence here And then let's put in a little bit of the other colors. I was up at CSU Mountain Campus teaching last week and um, there are ticks out. I was just thinking, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't even say this out loud. I might have to weave a tick. Um, I found several of them in my recent hikes. And we don't usually get them so much here, but um, it was really wet and it's been cool. So the ticks are super happy. We don't have Lyme disease in Colorado, at least not yet, but we do have other things, so they're a good thing to avoid. Um, oh, wow, yeah, Marla says she watched a flicker drill on a satellite dish. It is so loud, and so my bedroom's on the second floor of the house, and they were drilling on the um, metal that's right outside the window, you know, in the spring, the window's open. It's one of those, like, waking up with a like, whoa, because it's it sounds like a jackhammer. So I was really actually grateful to the starlings for moving into the flicker house because it means the flickers are um, not nesting there. We have starlings nesting there. Um, they also can be kind of mean little birds, but they have babies. So I'm going to 
do a little, I'm going to do one black stripe and then one more white. Just see how it looks. I have not, um, I was going to have that American Dipper piece, which I worked on here three weeks ago today, but um, as you can tell, um, it was not ready for show again. Perhaps in two weeks that one will be. Um, ready to work on. And this piece, you'll see if you take Summer of Tapestry, you'll see how it turns out. And also if I redo it. Okay, so there is a little black. And good thing about a copper pipe loom is you can turn it over <laughs> and you can see what's happening. I want these white ones back. Oops, I picked up a green there. Yeah, you'd think that the flickers would learn. I mean, after knocking their head against metal, you would think they'd be like, oh wait, I'm not making a dent here, but. I mean, maybe it was different flickers, but it'd be like every day for weeks. They're very territorial, so I feel like it was the same flicker just continuing to try to... And it was every year for like five years until I read more about it and it's like, oh, need to get a flicker house. And that has worked. Here I'm going to bring this white over to just um, make that slit connect. And then, oh, maybe I will do one more sequence of the white. Let's try it. This is, for whatever reason, one of the pieces. You know how sometimes you're weaving something and it's just so much fun? This is one of those pieces for me. Um, even though I think that um, the way I designed it is a little bit confusing, it doesn't matter because the purpose is just to have that fun and to spend time thinking about whatever it is I'm working on. So that is my goal. And this is just part of my tapestry diary. It's not like for sale or whatever. I mean, I might show it someday, but as part of a group, not as an individual thing. So it's just a practice of weaving. As Tommy says, Tommy Scanlon, weave every darn day. There, well that's kind of cool. And I kind of like having the stripes there. I think it's it's just interesting. Um, Oh, that's a, Suzanne says her guinea fowl keeps the place free of ticks. So all I need is chickens of some kind. Do chickens eat ticks? We haven't seen any in the backyard yet, but hiking, I have picked some up, so. Um, yeah, the part on the left is just a separate form and they, it is connected. I am connecting it with little bits of weft. Um, I could also st um, stitch it. It's just a design element. Uh, yeah, okay. So the next, let's see what time is it? When I'm having fun, I also lose track of what time it is. So here's my design. We're on the flicker and the robin. Now that we've been talking about the flicker, um, the colors for the flicker, I also made a list of the colors I was gonna use. So I actually did pull them all out ahead of time. I don't always do that. Sometimes I'm doing something like this, I'll just decide as I go along what colors I want. But the flicker is, let's see, this is Terracotta One. Flickers have those orange, I don't think I have a picture of a flicker here. Uh-uh. Um, they have those orange, really like salmon-y orange color, which is 
probably closer to this. So this is a Weaver's Bazaar color, um, sort of brownish orange. This is Tangerine from um, Array. So Terracotta Tangerine, a Weaver's Bazaar of which I don't know what color that is. And then I have two more Weaver's Bazaars for the feathers of the flicker are kind of brownish. This one says it's fawn. And this one is, who knows? clay. So they have, they don't have so much of the black and white thing. They have more of like a brownish thing going on. So let's start with the browner ones and then we'll add, I didn't leave myself a ton of room for the flicker. So maybe I'll kind of do it like I did the grackle with the brighter colors in the center and the feather colors on the outside. I think Maybe I'll start with the darker one and then I will mix them. These yarns are not quite the same size. The Weaver's Bazaar is thinner than the Array by a bit, but I'm just gonna fudge. I'm not gonna increase the size of my weft bundles, what I'm saying, because I wanna keep the lines fairly thin. And I'll just fill in if it isn't even. Um, how wide is this piece? Let's see, Bobby, I think it's four inches, but let me see. Three and a half. See, I was wrong. Bobby asked how wide it is. Three and a half inches. And 10, am I right about it being 10? Yep, 10 inch per inch. So... Oh, that's interesting. Marla says, we're talking about the flicker, um, that it's a territorial thing. That makes total sense to me, that it's just like they're broadcasting, this is my territory. So once it became the Starlings territory, maybe that's really why they stopped the uh, hammering on the side of my house. Let's just say a flicker house is a great thing. At least it has worked well for me. You know, I think I'm gonna go back. I'm just gonna do this with one strand because I have an idea that sometimes it using two is not always the best choice. So I agree with you, Anne. Weaving should be fun. Um, so let's make it fun. What size of warp? That's a great question. Um, this is I'm pretty sure it is um, 12, 6, it is 6, yes. This is at 10 EPI, I tend to use 12, 6 cotton Saint twine, which is a Swedish warp that I really like, and I get it from, um, if I had done that differently, that would be smoother. Let's take it out. So I've got hill threads here and here, if I had made them valleys, this little bit would be smoother. So I'm gonna put a lighter color on top. So let's just go back and make it smoother. I talk about hill and valley threads a lot in part two of Warp and Weft, and it's an updated part. I It's been several years since I did the update, but if you were one of the people who took the very first Warp and Weft way back in the day, um, nine years ago when I first released it, um, go back and look at the, oh, see, I just, I messed that up again because I was talking. Um, go back and look at part two, the edition about angles, and I talk about hills and valleys 
a lot. It's the a good way to learn about. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Let's use the lighter color. Maybe. Let's do, here's some fun. Let's try mixing these two. Um, the Weaver's Bazaar and the Terracotta, um, just for a stripe and see what it looks like. Um, Weaver's Bazaar is 18.2. Um, I don't know what the number of array is. I find that, that the numbers are referring to the number of plies, and yes, the 18 has some bearing on whatever the one ply size is, but I find that it's inconsistent, and that is frustrating. So I use three strands of array at eight ends per inch, and I use six strands of Weaver's Bazaar Fine at eight ends per inch, if that helps. The Weaver's Bazaar is quite a bit thinner than the array, is all that means. And you could ask Array, you could ask Just Yarn um, if they have a sizing for their Array yarn, but I don't know what it is. Somebody here probably knows. I find that, that those numbers are not super helpful because they different manufacturers use them in different ways, and so you think you're getting the same size yarn and it's totally different. And wools versus cottons like a 5-2 cotton is not at all the same size as a 5-2 wool so it's uh actually fairly frustrating if you're trying to use that to compare sizing of weft yarns let's see could be that someone has a better answer for you on that though than i do <laughs> Not always right about these things. Um, yes, Monica, I use, um, she says repeat how many strands of each at what set. At eight ends per inch, this is 10, but I'm just saying in general, I use eight ends per inch in my classes to give you a reference. Um, I use six strands of Weaver's Bazaar Fine at eight, six. And three of the medium, the medium Weaver's Bazaar is twice the size of the fine. And then array is closer to the medium Weaver's Bazaar. So I use um, three or four of the array at eight EPI. So right now it would make more sense for me to use three strands of this against two of the array on this piece, but I'm not doing that partly because I get a thinner line. If I want a thinner line, um, I can get that with a thinner weft bundle. And in a little piece like this, it doesn't really matter if the wefts are all even. I'm weaving this eccentrically for another pick and then I need to fill it in. Oh, you know what? I'm going to go back to what I did before. More tails, but... Just one strand instead of two. Because... Oops. I want to go under this. Somehow I've worked on this for 45 minutes and it feels like three minutes. Um, yeah, that's helpful, Renee. So Array's um, website says, I knew someone would look it up. Uh, that their wool is 212. So 182 in the UK, they tend to, whatever, the numbers are often flipped, flopped, but probably the 12 and the 18. So 18, two for the um, Weaver's Bazaar and 12, two or 212 
for the array, that 12 and the 18 probably refers to how big the individual plies are. So they're smaller in the array, larger in the, there's, they are larger in the array and smaller in the Weaver's Bazaar. The two refers to the number of plies, almost always. So if you have a 10-2 pearl cotton, you can at least know that it's a two-ply yarn. Usually, it's not always the case. So yarn construction is, the best thing is to get some of the yarn and really work with it and see what it is actually like. Okay, I'm gonna pigtail this. This is that clay color. And then I'm gonna put more of the orangey color in here for the flicker. Once I go and find a flicker picture to refer to, a flicker picture. Um, yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun little tapestry. I'm having fun weaving this. So that's the whole idea, right? Um, yeah, weaving yarn is a foreign language. So, and that's the thing is that every different fiber, the numbers for linen are different from the numbers for cotton. Like they mean different things in terms of the size. Liz Gibson has a really nice little book called the Weaver's Guide to Yarn or something that explains more about that numbering system. So Liz Gibson is yarn worker. She does rigid heddle stuff, but she has a book that explains that a little bit more. Well worth getting. I think you can just get a digital copy too. It's a tiny little book, but um, it's, fan it's fantastic if you're confused about all the yarns. Basically the upshot though is that um, every different fiber has a different system which dates back to the guilds, like in Europe, in the 18, 1700s, whatever. Every guild had a different system, and so it's still kind of messed up. Um, yeah, Mari says, uh, USA uses plies first, UK second. And I have seen yarns in both places flipped around, so who knows? Um, Canada puts the ply second. Um, the ply for the, yeah, warps I use is second, so I don't know. We don't have that many mills left in the USA, so it's, uh, who knows. Yeah, grist. Thanks, Mary Lou. That's the, that's the, <laughs> that's the word. 18, 12 and 18 are for the grist, and the, the two part is the number of plies. Um, awesome. Thanks for coming, you all. I'm glad you uh, hung out with me today. If you want to join Summer of Tapestry, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm very excited to release the first prompt on Friday. And I think sometimes people are confused about the word prompt. Um, it's an idea of what we're going to be working on, but there's lots of options. So it's not, I'm not just giving you a, a one sentence thing. I'm doing what I always do and over teach everything. So <laughs> you want a lot of teaching, Summer of Tapestry is a great deal because it's also not an expensive class. Um, thank you, and I'll be back on June 14. Have fun. In the meantime, y'all, I hope you're weaving and finding something um, fun to do, whether you have a summer break or not. Bye-bye.